The debate is, what is a recession? For most people, they've defined recession as two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP. Now, we got that in the first half of this year with a decline of 1.6% in the first quarter and six-tenths of 1% of GDP in the second quarter, two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP. However, that is not the definition of a recession. That is the definition used by high school economics teachers for uh, the freshman level uh, economics class. Uh, we really need to define what is exactly a recession. Um, and so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, first of all, how many of you have ever heard of the National Bureau of Economic Research? I got one person, one person who's heard of it. You want to stand up and tell us? No, I won't do that. <laughs> the National Bureau of Economic Research is a private, nonpartisan organization, nonprofit organization, headquartered in Massachusetts. The board is made up of 50 economists. They have quarterly board meetings. <clears throat> Can you imagine going to dinner with 50 economists four times a year? I mean, that can't be a whole lot of fun, can it? Um, but at any rate, the 50 board members get together, and the 50 economists come from business economists. They also ac um, academic uh, institutions, a variety of backgrounds. The 50 of them get together, and they decide, arbitrate, whether or not we've had a recession. On what basis do they make that arbitration? There are four specific areas that they review to determine whether we've had a recession. These four areas together need to produce a significant and prolonged period of um, declines in each of those areas in order to qualify as a recession, okay? Let's talk about the four areas. First one is real incomes. Are incomes rising, falling, or are they stagnant? And obviously, if incomes are declining, that's a weakness in the economy, and it's one of the probably the, one of the uh, major ones they look at to determine whether or not we've been in a recession. Secondly, they look at employment. Is unemployment rising, are jobs growing, or are jobs declining? That's the second uh, consideration they, they look at. Thirdly, output. Uh, is the economy increasing production and output of goods and services, or is um, the economy weak enough that those output of goods and services are declining. And finally, consumption. Both uh, personal consumption as well as capital expenditures by companies. So those are the four areas that they review and put them together to determine whether or not we've had a recession. This is pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Um, in order to make this a useful presentation, I want to go through the four steps you have to go through prior to a colonoscopy. And I have <laughs> I have pictures, so um, this, this next part of the presentation, maybe, you, no, I won't do that. Um, but I do need to spend some time looking at each of these four areas as to whether or not we've gone through a, a session because we had two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP. First of all, so there we go. Let's look at personal disposable income. And I did this on a real basis, so I factored out the inflation. As you can see on the left-hand side, right-hand side of the chart as you're looking at it, um, we are. Uh, real incomes have declined and declined dramatically uh, through the course of the last uh, seven or eight months. Obviously, incomes are rising, but they're rising at about 5% on a year-over-year -year basis, while inflation's running at 8%. So real incomes are declining. So if that were the only criteria, in determining whether we have a recession or not, the conclusion would be, yep, we have a recession. However, let's look at the other areas. Employment. Employment is not declining. Employment is increasing. Now, the rate of increase has slowed, as you can see. We averaged a little over 400,000 a month increases in non-farm payrolls through July. And since July, we've seen that slow. Now, we'll get Friday, this Friday, uh, the employment report for October, expectations are that it's going to be less than 200,000 increase in non-farm payrolls after a better than 200,000 
uh, increase reported for um, September. Certainly job growth has slowed, but it is not declining. So from that standpoint, we're not in a recession. Output, and I use industrial production as the best measure of that. As you can see, industrial production is not declining, it's rising. Industrial production is growing. And the growth is uh, accelerating, actually. We can see faster growth over the last few months than we've gotten, than we, than we had earlier when the first half of this year when we saw the negative real GDP numbers. So if that were the only criteria, we're not in a recession. And finally, uh, consumption. Personal consumption expenditures on a real basis have slowed from where they were coming out of the uh, pandemic and the quarantines that we went through, but they have not turned negative. In fact, third quarter real GDP, which was reported last week, was reported as having increased by 2.6% after the declines in the first half of, of this year. Now, that number, it's, it's a, that's a very strong um, GDP report, but it's a very misleading real GDP report. The reason we got as much as a 2.6% increase in real GDP was a huge decline in the trade deficit. We increased exports at an uh, unsustainable rate, uh, and the trade deficit therefore went down. The trade deficit is a drag on, the, on economic growth in this country. The lower the trade deficit, the more the faster um, the U.S. economy will grow. Secondly, we saw a big swing in the third quarter in government spending, which was a surprise to everybody. Everyone expected government spending to be down because we weren't, we'd worked our way through the stimulus programs and all of the stimulus that was added with the fiscal policy uh, decisions made over the last couple of years. In reality, the federal government spending increased by over 3% in the third quarter. Why did, it, it, why did government spending go up 3%? It wasn't for giving student loan debt, because that, that hasn't hit the economy yet. That's yet to come. The reason government, federal government spending went from a uh, decline of 2% in the first half of this year to an increase of 3.7% in the third quarter was defense spending. When you send missile systems to the Ukraine, Somebody pays for that. That's output, and they need to be replaced. So uh, defense spending shot up dramatically in the third quarter. So those two factors, uh, the, the decline in the trade deficit added 2.8% to growth in the third quarter, and total growth was only 2.6%. So absent the increase or the decline in the trade deficit, we would have had another negative quarter of real GDP. Okay, um, but real personal consumption expenditures grew at 1.4% in the third quarter, which was actually down from the 2% rate of growth in the first half of this year. So if we look at the four components that the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research uh, focuses on to define a recession, real incomes are declining, employment is rising, output is rising, and uh, personal consumption expenditures are still growing at a slower pace, but are growing. So as a result, uh, the Bureau has said, nope, we did not have a recession so far this year. So their definition is we haven't had a recession. Now at this point in the process, I always stop and say, all of you in terms of your own business, just think of your own business. Did it, do you feel like we, we were in a recession or have had a recession? Don't think about all the fears and uncertainties going forward, your actual revenues, earnings, uh, performance this year. How many people here think they, they've, they're experiencing a recession? That's consistent. One, I got one. I want to ask you what business you're in. Two, I got two. Um, see me afterwards. I want to know what uh, businesses you're in. That uh, is it housing related? The egg, the egg? sector, and that's because rising input costs are significantly greater than the increased uh, revenues, okay? Well, there may be some sectors that, that have felt like a recession, mostly the housing sector, which has really suffered 
with the uh, changes in the uh, monetary policy being executed by the Fed, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But generally, when I do that survey, and I try to do it every time I speak, I get very few people say, no, you know, this is a good year. We're having a good year with sales and revenues and earnings. It doesn't feel like a recession. Now, I'm worried about the future. I think, you know, we got real concerns about what next year is going to be like. But at least at this point, the response I generally get is, no, we haven't had a recession. So let's look at what the outlook is for each of the four sectors I've talked about going forward. Um, obviously, all of these sectors are affected by inflation. And the issue that we have in the economy today is this huge increase in inflation. And this happens to be the consumer price index, both, both the total as well as the core rate. Total um, CPI through um, September, the last month we have the data for, is up about 8.2 percent. The increase in the core rate, it's excluding food and energy, is up about uh, 6.2 percent. The Federal Reserve has said that they think 2 percent inflation is a healthy level, that at a 2 percent inflation rate is reflective of a healthy, growing economy. And therefore, with the kind of inflation rates we've experienced, um, it's unacceptable and they need to get inflation down. And we all know that. Every time we go to the grocery store or fill up in the gas, fill gas up in the car, uh, we buy anything, we know what the insidious uh, effects of inflation, that we just can't keep up with these price increases that we've been experiencing. So the, and ultimately that will lead to a recession when people can't afford to buy things anymore. And we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Um, Home heating oil are skyrocketing, going to skyrocket this uh, winter. Diesel price, look at the spread between diesel prices and gasoline prices. It's huge. And that spread reflects a lack of supply of diesel and ultimately home heating oil relative to the supply and demand environment for gasoline. Gasoline has come down in price because the demand for gasoline went down. As the price went up, people drove less and used less gasoline. They've been more, they've uh, attempted to conserve. But this inflation rate has been um, insidious and it has shown no signs of um, declining, of moderating or coming back down. And the Federal Reserve says, until we see clear evidence that, it, that inflation is beginning to moderate and moving toward our 2% target rate, we're going to continue to raise interest rates. So obviously the Fed is met yesterday and today for their uh, regularly scheduled FOMC meeting. And um, they should announce at 2 o'clock this afternoon another 75 basis points or three quarters of 1% increase in interest rates. Now, having said that, I have to recognize that <clears throat> I can be wrong faster with that forecast than I normally am. I'm, I can be wrong over time, a lot of times, normally not within about a two or three hour period though. So um, at two o'clock we'll find out how fast I was either right or wrong about the 75 basis point increase because the Fed has had no evidence, sees no evidence of a decline in inflation. Now the thing we got to remember is the CPI is one measure of inflation. The Fed's primary measure of inflation is something called the PCE price index, the core rate, is what they focus on for inflation. This number is considerably lower, although it's increased uh, like the CPI has, but it's considerably lower than the CPI because of the difference in the way they uh, calculate these two indexes. Uh, the CPI, about th a third of the CPI price index is housing related. So um, even though people don't buy a house every month, um, they incorporate in the CPI the increasing house, house prices. And, it, and also rents are included uh, in that. So as rents go up, um, that affects the CPI. That's the biggest single difference. But the other difference is the CPI has a constant basket of goods. They don't change those. Uh, that basket of goods that they survey each month on prices uh, determine what inflation's done. 
PCE uh, index changes that basket of goods to reflect what they think people are actually buying. So when you go in and say, I'm not buying the Heinz ketchup, I'm buying the Kroger brand ketchup, you've changed what you buy because it's less expensive to buy off brands. So the, the PCE index incorporates the changes that people make in their per, what they purchase due to the prices associated with it. As a result of that, the PCE numbers are lower. For example, the total PCE index is up about 6.1% as opposed to the 8.2% for the CPI, and the core rate is up 5.1% on a trailing 12-month basis as opposed to the better than 6% rate for the core CPI number. The Fed's focused on the core PCE index. That's what they say needs to get down to 2%. This is, what, this is the number they're shooting for. At 5.1% on a trailing 12-month basis, we have a long way to go to get inflation down to the levels that the Fed wants to see. The Fed has also said we're done forecasting, that we've been wrong so many times uh, about our forecasts that we're not going to change our monetary policy direction until we get clear evidence data reflecting the results that we want to see. So we're not going to see the Fed stop raising rates until the inflation rate comes down. We don't think that happens until probably um, first quarter of next year before we start to see some moderation in these inflation numbers. Um, and therefore, we, we think the Fed's going to continue to raise interest rates um, as they go forward. Um, now, let's look at some individual areas in terms of, we talked about the total numbers, but if you look at the sectors, food prices year over year up almost 12% year over year. Um, energy prices 20.3%, with gasoline prices only up 18.2%. That's only that's up less than the overall energy price increase. Natural gas up 33%, and this number is going to get worse too as we go into winter and the demand for natural gas increases. Um, electricity up 15%. Those are some huge increases on a year-over-year -year basis in basic needs that people have. Um, shelter costs, interestingly, which includes rents as well as home prices, are only up 6.6%, and that's because of the lag. Um, when rents go up, typically uh, you don't see the rent increase until your lease expires, if you're renting. So it may take nine months for an increase in rental rates to affect the inflation rate. How, because you don't buy a house or sell a house every month, until that happens, it won't affect the um, inflation rate using the uh, personal consumption expenditure price indexes, so there's a lag here. So we know that, in, that shelter costs are going to continue to rise just to reflect the price increases that have already been executed over the last few months. Um, new vehicles are only up 9.4. That number is actually down. That number was well over 12 percent for new vehicle purchases, um, and it has come down. We've started to see the supply chain restrictions in the auto industry ease. Uh, in fact, we saw over 15 million new cars sales reported for the month of October, up from 13 million. That's an annualized number, by the way. Doesn't mean they sold that many cars in one month. Um, but we saw a significant increase in new car sales in the month of October relative to anything we've experienced any other month this year. The supply chain problems are starting to ease. They're starting to get products. Parts are starting to be delivered. So prices on new cars will actually come down. Okay. Now, there are two kinds of inflations that we need to talk about. First of all, there's the typical cyclical inflation. And cyclical inflation occurs in the course of the normal business cycle. That at some point in a business cycle, consumers, unemployment's low, lots of people making money, they're out spending it, they're buying new th uh, houses, or they're redecorating the house they've got, they're taking vacations, uh, they're spending money. 
And as they do that, as consumer confidence is up and business confidence is up because of a strong economy, prices go up because demand rises faster than the system can produce supply for it. That's a typical business cycle. And certainly we've experienced that. Um, now the traditional responses to inflation from the normal business cycle are twofold. First of all, uh, monetary policy. In that normal business cycle, the Fed would raise rates at, in the expansion phase of a business cycle in order to moderate demand to keep the supply-demand equation in balance. And secondly, we'd see fiscal policy uh, change. We'd see uh, fiscal policy that might um, increase taxes or reduce spending uh, during the up phase of a business cycle. Uh, and that would be the typical response. The problem we've got in this country is that on top of a normal business cycle, we have a significant problem with structural inflation. And that's what I want to focus on, the structural inflation that, are, that is in the system that will keep inflation higher longer than we would typically expect or experience, okay? So let's talk about it. Well, first of all, this is the Fed uh, increase in rates. You can see a huge, huge gap. Now, I do want to talk about one thing here. We have what's called an inverted yield curve. An inverted yield curve means that the yield on longer term uh, bonds is lower than the yield on shorter term bonds. For example, this morning, the two-year treasury, two-year maturity treasury, has a yield of 4.54%. It's over 4.5% this morning. It'll probably go down this afternoon if, if the Fed does announce 75 basis point increase, um, just because the market's already priced in the 75 basis point increase. But the yield on a 10-year treasury to buy something for 10 years was only 4.04%. It was a half a percentage point lower in yield than the yield on a two-year treasury. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? If you're going to lend money to the government for a longer period on a fixed rate, wouldn't you expect to get a higher yield than if you lend it to the government to a, on a shorter-term basis? The inversion in the yield curve is occurring because short rates are driven primarily by fiscal po uh, by monetary policy. It's the expectation of what the Fed is going to do with interest rates. And certainly investors fully expect the Fed to raise rates and continue to raise rates for some period of time into the future. Okay? And therefore the yield on the two year, which is driven by that expectation, moved up significantly more as the Fed changed course in monetary policy than the 10 year. The 10 year a longer term uh, bond yield is driven by inflation expectations on a longer term basis. So what the market is saying to us is that yes, they expect the Fed to continue to raise rates, but that inflation will moderate going forward over time. And it produces the inverted yield curve. Now typically people cite the inverted yield curve as uh, a sure sign that a recession's looming and on the way because uh, an inverted yield curve has accurately forecast four out of the last 11 recessions. Um, Got to think about that for a minute. Four out of the, so they've been wrong seven times versus the four times they were right with an inverted yield curve. Um, you got to be careful because when you're looking at investors' attitudes as an indication of what's going to happen going forward, um, that tends to be ruled by emotion. Uh, I would submit to you that at any point in time, any capital market, whether it's a stock market, the bond market, what, whatever it is, is always uh, dominated by one of three emotions. It's either dominated by fear, it's dominated by um, optimism, or it's neutral, somewhere in between fear and optimism. Clearly, today's markets are being dominated by fear. High rates, declining stock prices. The question is, what will change 
uh, investor attitudes? What, what will change them moving from fear to at least neutral, if not a point of optimism? When will that come? That'll be interesting to see what happens. All right, let's talk about the structural issues. First of all, the labor market. Um, we have a problem in this country. We are short workers. Uh, we will continue to be short workers. And because we are short workers, we're going to continue to have a tight labor market. And that means that wages are going to continue to rise as employers have to raise wages in order to retain and attract the workers they need. That's, that's the reality of the world. Um, as you can see, the unemployment rate, which is the red line, down to 3.5%, and uh, average hourly earnings are the blue line up dramatically. Now, the problem is that the average hourly earnings increases haven't been as much as inflation. So real incomes are still negative that we saw earlier. Okay? At some point, uh, that can't continue, and it won't continue. Uh, how many of you here have ever heard of the JOLTS index? Anybody heard of the JOLTS index? I, Eric nodded his head. I could hear it. Um, okay, the JOLTS index stands for Job Openings and Labor Transfer Survey. The, the Labor Department every month goes out and asks employers, how many posted but unfilled jobs do you have? And they report back. The JOLTS number, uh, which is the um, blue line, skyrocketed, obviously, as we came out of the pandemic. And companies were not able to bring back workers at anywhere near the rate <clears throat> that they needed to increase production and output to meet the surge in demand. And that's created and contributed significantly to the supply chain problems we've all heard about. Okay. Now, the JOLTS index has come off its peak. It was up almost to 12 million posted and unfilled jobs in July. In August, it dropped to less than 10 million. So we saw a pretty sizable decline in the um, number of unfilled jobs in this country. Uh, however, the JOLTS index came out earlier this week, on, actually yesterday, reported that the number increased back to above 10 million jobs for the month of September. There's a one month lag in getting this data. So clearly we have a huge number of unfilled jobs in this country that are not being filled. It's gonna be difficult to get production output out or up sufficiently to meet the level of supply if companies can't fill those jobs. That's an issue. Now, interestingly enough, in the unemployment survey, uh, they estimate that the number of people who say they want a job but can't find one is around 4 million people. So we have a little over two and a half times the number of job openings in this country um, as, uh, as compared to the number of people who say they're looking for work. That's the tight labor market. Pretty difficult to get a recession when you've got <clears throat> this tight uh, a labor market and wages are gonna continue to go up. So structurally, this is gonna contribute to additional infl inflation pressures going forward. That's a structural problem. Now, there's a solution to this problem, and an immediate solution. Anybody think of a solution to this problem? Thank you, immigration. You're an ec economics major? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So we have to, because she's the only one. Who, oh, all right, never mind. Um, immigration. We're spending all this time arguing about immigration when in reality, we need those workers. The question is, how do we get them in this country legally? How do we get them trained? Things like, can you speak English? Um, can you do math? I mean, those kinds of things, basic skills to fill these jobs. But I'll tell you, I still go into restaurants where there are empty tables because they can't get enough servers. They can't get enough uh, cooks. Um, airlines can't get enough baggage handlers. Um, 
the healthcare industry can't get enough aides and can't get enough custodial people. Those are all limiting the ability of those sectors of the economy to ramp up their capacity so that we get a better uh, relationship between the supply and the demand. So we need to address this labor shortage because it gets compounded. This is what's called the uh, participation rate. Something's happened in this country. People, there are far fewer people who want to go back to work after the pandemic than were working prior to the pandemic. There's lots of studies out there as to why this is the case. Um, I mean, there's studies on the cost of child care, the availability of child care, limits the two wage earner family, somebody's got to stay home um, with the kids because I can't afford or can't find um, adequate child care. There's people who say, I don't want to go back to work uh, and risk getting uh, the virus again uh, because I'll be in close contact with people. There are people who say, I don't want to go back to work unless I can work from home. I don't want to go into the office. I don't want to commute, go through that cost. Um, there's all kinds of studies as to why, but we're running a, a much lower participation rate, the percentage of people 16 years of age and older who are working in this country than we had prior to the pandemic. I don't know what corrects this. I don't know what, what finally gets it. Maybe it takes a recession to get people to come back to work and want to work and take a job. But I know, for example, that of the 11 million jobs that are open in this country, uh, at least through the end of September, you know how many people quit their jobs in September? Four million. Four million people quit their jobs in September. That doesn't mean they left the work, left the workforce. They quit their jobs because they took a job somewhere else that pays more money, or gives more benefits, or allows them to work from home, or provides daycare centers for kids. There's lots of reasons, but people um, are qu readily quitting a job to take a job somewhere else to achieve a lifestyle that they desire. So there's a, there's a basic change in the nature of the workforce in this country, the labor force. That's a structural contributor to higher inflation. You don't correct that structural problem in six weeks, in six months. This is a two, three, four, five year time frame to get the participation rate back up to anywhere near what it was prior to the pandemic. A structural issue in the labor force. Okay, environmental. Th now this is gonna get sound political, I gotta watch this one. Um, you can't go from fossil fuel based economy to a green energy economy at the speed at which we've attempted to do that. Um, you can't make that huge a change in the nature of the economy and what, what excuse the pun, what fuels the economy uh, as quickly as we've attempted to do that. Um, it may be laudable, and I'm not arguing about climate change or whether the globe is warming or not. Uh, clearly it is. Uh, I'm not going to argue about whether that's a long-term weather cycle or it's because we all drive combustion engine cars. Um, I won't get into that. The reality is, though, that there are those who have decided that the world will end unless we get rid of all combustion engine cars by 2035. Unless you're in California, and, the, and then it's a lot earlier than that. Um, we've, we've made some terrible decisions that has exacerbated the inflation problem. It's a structural issue. You can't shut off the uh, XL pipeline just close it down. You can't, I mean, the argument is these oil companies have all these leases that they should be drilling on, they're not leasing, or they're not drilling. Well, the problem is in order to drill on the leased land they've already got, they've got to get environmental permits. And the environmental permits are being held up. But more importantly, what oil, what exploration company wants to go out and spend all the money to drill for oil when the government's saying, we're gonna shut down the oil industry in the next 15 years. 
that's a terrible investment for them. So the more we talk about moving away from fossil fuel dependence, um, the more of a problem we're going to have. And therefore, energy prices are going to go up and, and constantly go up because we're not going to produce enough in this country to meet the needs, even if we move as quickly as some people want us to, to a green energy solution. Um, this, this is a structural problem and one we have to resolve as to the timing and how quickly all of this can happen and what the cost to us all. I mean, there are people who say, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what it costs. If gas is $8 a gallon, that's great because it means you won't drive much and that'll be less of a contributor to the environmental damage that we're doing. So we got to resolve this issue about how quickly we can make that change. Demographics. Structural problem. The birth rate in this country has dropped dramatically. We need 2.1 children per child-bearing woman, women in this country. Um, now, I can get into gender problems all day long and, and use the right pronouns uh, without... My sensitivity training didn't take it all. I, uh, they, they've worked on me and I can't, I can't seem to get it right. Um, the reality is that uh, po our population will be uh, stagnant at about 330 million people in this country if our birth rate is 2.1. You need 2.1 children per childbearing aged woman to maintain the population. In the last two years, our, our birth rate has dropped below two. So we are shrinking our population as a result of a change in lifestyles and decisions being made and all of that. So that's a structural problem. We're not growing the population. We're not going to have sufficient resources and increase in demand. It's not just a matter of not enough people to work. It's in part demand increases because the population grows. And without the increase in demand, you won't get the economy to expand. It's going to take, I think, well, it's going to take at least nine months to get the birth rate back up. I mean, that much I know. I uh, can't, can't do it any faster than that, I guess. Um, but it's going to take years to resolve this. Again, immigration is going to be an issue that we have to deal with because of that problem. Political instability. And I'm not talking just about in the United States. And we certainly have huge amounts of political instability in the United States. But it's worldwide. Um, I saw Denmark yesterday was trying to form a new government because the election they had wasn't uh, definitive in terms of one side or the other. Denmark, I mean, whoever heard about political instability in Denmark, let alone Iran, China, Russia, Ukraine, um, France, uh, Israel's change, I mean, Every place you look at, South America is a mess, virtually all those countries. We have political instability around the world. That's not conducive to confidence, to optimism, to people willing to uh, uh, grow their business, invest in their business, um, hire people, spend more money, grow the economy. Political instability is a problem. It's got to be resolved at some point. The, the basic problem, and this is my humble opinion, is, and I've said this before, we have a basic uh, problem in this country in that we refuse to make the decision about what the role of the federal government is. And I'm talking about economically. Is the role of the federal government to produce equal outcomes for everyone, or is the role of the federal government to produce equal opportunities for everyone. That decision we have not made. We have a, virtually a split in this country between those two attitudes. Now, each of those have risks. Equal opportunity produces income inequality. People, if you have, everybody has equal opportunity, not everybody takes advantage of those opportunities, either because they can't, because of the school system they were in or the barriers that are put up there, but not everybody takes advantage of the equal opportunities, even if they truly, in fact, exist. So you end up with inequality. On the other hand, equal outcomes 
eliminates incentives. It, it, it eliminates risk taking. There's no reason to go out and invest and hire people and grow your business, take the risks associated with it when the government is going to provide equal outcomes for everyone. Redistribute what incomes are available. So both ends of the spectrum have risks associated. And the problem we have in this country is we haven't decided definitively which one of those we want to go toward, that we want to make decisions within that context. Until that decision gets made definitively, one way or the other, we're going to continue to have this political instability. That's a long-term structural problem which produces higher inflation than it would otherwise. Uh, structural problems in this country are, are significant. So the labor market, and finally the last thing, and someday I'm going to figure out how to get this to pop up in the right order, uh, regulations. Uh, we have seen a significant increase in federal government regulations over the course of the last two years. I understand that sounds like a political statement. I think it's a reality. I think most people would agree that that's what's happened. Um, the regulations have resulted in less production domestically of fossil fuels, fracking, uh, reduction in that, XL pipeline, you name it, there's all kinds, but there's regulations being issued every day. Uh, in fact, we've got a debate going on right now about forgiving student, student loans, student debt. And it's being done by executive fiat. It's not done by Congress or a law. It's being done by a regulation issued by um, um, a part of government. When you start issuing regulations, it inhibits companies' desire, willingness to take risks and expand their business. That means that the supply-demand uh, equation gets out of balance. So the more regulations we have, the more risk we have that it creates imbalances to put upward pressure on inflation. Now, I'm not saying you ought to get rid of every regulation. Uh, I think the, the issue is which ones make sense? Which ones do we have to have? Um, certainly an unfettered private sector produces excesses historically that we've seen that are unacceptable. Uh, go back to the early part of the 19th century and you know you had 12 year old kids working in mines uh, because there were no regulations. You can't do you, you can't get rid of every regulation but we have to make sense we have to we have to pass regulations adopt them that make sense and at this point we're creating an environment where there is fear that we're going to get more regulations, not less regulation going forward. That creates uh, instability. So we end up with that environment. As a result of these structural issues, you can see what's happened to consumer confidence. Consumer confidence is uh, the blue line. It has come down dramatically from where it was coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and real consumption expenditures, the red line, have also come down. They haven't turned negative yet, but they're getting close. They're getting close. Um, and I think it's largely due to those structural issues as opposed to belief that the business cycle is going to turn negative for us. There are significant risks going forward to anybody's expectations. Certainly one of those is if the virus comes up again. I've heard stories, and I think we all have, that we're going to suffer a flu and coronavirus uh, spike together. So we all have to go out and get flu shots and another booster shot for the coronavirus. If that were to occur and we ended up taking the draconian measures we've taken in the past when the virus picks up, then anybody's forecast is out the window. Uh, that's a risk. The labor market is a structural risk, but it's also a short-term risk. So it affects inflation in both cases. Uh, supply chain issues are getting better. Uh, we've made progress on that, but we're not all the way there yet. Uh, I had somebody at one of our meetings uh, last week uh, who was in the construction business said that he's still being um, allocated cement, that he can only get cement two days a week. Uh, he can't get it the rest of the week. And is, the cement that he can get is less than he ordered. He also said steel 
is being allocated, uh, that there's problems getting steel. So there's still issues in the supply chain yet to be addressed, largely because of the structural problems I've already, already gone through. That needs to continue to improve. I don't know how they're going to, how, how are they going to build the Intel plants down in Columbus? Um, I mean, they don't have enough electricians, they don't have enough carpenters, they don't have enough bricklayers, plumbers to build that plant. They're going to have to take, either bring people in from outside the area to do that, a lot of that work, or they're going to have to uh, take people who are there and hire them away from the jobs they're in. In any way, it's going to impact the labor market in Columbus. Uh, and that's just one example. Let's build an EV battery plant just southeast of there, too, just to add to the problem. Um, so you're going to find pockets where this increase in industrial production is going to be um, held up by the labor problems. Um, it's interesting that um, one of the big problems we had in the supply chain was the chips manufacturing. We didn't have enough semiconductor chips to fill uh, to, to meet the demand. Um, Intel's going to build this huge complex. I think there's two plants, is there, Eric? Or four altogether, not counting suppliers that will come in along with them. When's the first chip going to be produced on there? Five years from now. That's a structural problem, isn't it? We're going to be, we're, we may be able to build enough chips five years from now, but over the next five years, we're still going to be short chips, dependent upon the political stable uh, Formosa, Taiwan, uh, which produces most of our chips, along with South Korea. Uh, forget China, we don't want to get into that issue. Um, so we've got this structural problem that will inhibit the growth of industrial production and therefore limit the output in our economy. Our trade deficit was down dramatically, narrowed dramatically in the third quarter. It's going to go back up. And it's going to go back up because of the strength of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is, is huge. I mean, the increase in the value of the dollar relative to other currencies has been huge. When that happens, our exports get more expensive overseas and the imports get less expensive in this country. That produces a significant trade deficit. We import more because it's less expensive. We export less because it's more expensive with the strength of the dollar. So the trade deficit is going to be a major issue, let alone what are the economies that we're trading with growing at. Europe is probably, uh, uh, they're, if they're not in a recession, they certainly are very close to a recession. And that, how many goods and services can you export to areas where they're experiencing recessionary factors, okay? Um, I'm not even going to forecast this. I haven't got a clue what's going to happen next Tuesday. I mean, I suppose it depends whether you're, you're watching MSNBC or Fox News as to what you might think is going to happen. Um, it's another reflection of that uh, division that exists that I talked about, the basic uh, decision about where we're headed. But clearly, the outcome of the midterm election will have an impact short term as to what 2023 might look like. Um, one way or the other, it's going to have an impact. So I, I have no idea what, how it's going to turn out, but it's going to have an impact on what we see. Inflation is going to come down in 2023. It will come down because they measure it on a year-over-year -year basis, and we will be chopping off some months in 2022 where there were increases of a half a one to one percent in inflation in the month and we'll be replacing it with months that are increasing by three tenths of one percent. So the year over year inflation rate will come down because we've gone the we've gone through the real the huge spikes that we got but a lot of that had to do with the low base from which we were making that calculation. The base is now higher so the increasing prices become a smaller percentage as you do the calculations. So as a result, yeah, I expect inflation will come down in 2023. Will it get to 2%? I don't think so. I don't think so. We'll continue to see that.
Obviously, the Federal Reserve is not the wild card. The last thing you do is describe those guys as a bunch of wild guys, but or women, excuse me, on sensitivity, um, people. I'm not sure what what pronoun can I use? I can't. I, never mind. I won't get into that. Um, the reality is, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise rates. We think. I think they'll see 75 basis points today. We'll see another 50 basis point increase the middle of December. So we'll be up another 100, a point and a quarter between now and year end from where we are right now. And that we'll see another 50 basis points or half of 1% in the first probably three months of 2023. At that point, I think the Fed will pause. In other words, they'll, they'll stop raising rates and to determine whether or not what they've already done is sufficient to achieve the desired result of reducing the growth in inflation. Um, and so they'll pause at that point. If it does, if we see inflation coming back down, uh, then we might even see a cut by the Federal Reserve by late next year or early in 2024. If inflation doesn't subside to sufficient to meet their objectives, there'll be further rate increases. Now we're talking about, and I'll use the prime rate, although nobody borrows at the prime rate anymore, uh, unless you've got a home equity line, maybe that's about it. Um, but I'll use it as an indication of what it costs to borrow money. Right now the prime rate's six and a quarter, up from three and a quarter at the beginning of the year. So I think we're looking at a prime rate of seven and a half percent by the end of this year and will be eight percent by the end of the second quarter of next year. I think that rate is high enough to suspend a lot of people's plans for borrowing and investing in their business or borrowing to buy things. The increase in consumer spending that has happened here uh, over the last three quarters uh, is in spite of the fact that real incomes have declined. So how have consumers compensated for that? They've done two things. They've used up the liquidity they built over the last, uh, what, three years with all the stimulus checks that have been issued. They've used, a lot of that was saved. It's now being used up. We're watching bank deposits will decline in this environment as people and companies use up that cash to meet their daily requirements. But consumers have also increased borrowing. And where do we see that? Credit cards. Credit card, consumer credit card debt monthly is running in the area 25 billion a month increases. It was running, oh, 10 to $12 billion a month in, in, uh, in 2021 and early 2022. So it's more than doubled. Consumers have borrowed money and used up financial resources to continue to uh, buy things and support growth in personal consumption expenditures. That will end. At some point they run out of borrowing capacity or liquidity. So I think what we're looking at is a recession in the first half of 2023. And that all four of the categories that the National, uh, Labor, or National Economic Bureau of Research looks at will be looking at negative numbers and will declare it a recession. So we see a recession, I think it'll be relatively mild and will last six to maybe nine months at the most. And during that time, inflation rates will come down and ultimately the Fed will be in a position to cut interest rates. I appreciate you all and I just thank you for whatever attention you were able to give me. Amen.